It's a great pleasure to be with you at both Dusseldorf today, even though, of course, virtually, I would have much rather be with you in person. I am now uh, speaking from beautiful Madrid, where we are still fully engaged with uh, a very strong FITUR, which is the tourism show that takes place here in Madrid in our headquarters. We had many delegations coming to FITUR. And uh, I do hope that next year in a full fledged, we'll be able to be present also in both Dusseldorf. It is, as I said, a pleasure, an honor. And uh, most of all, it is very important for UNWTO, the United Nations Agency for World Tourism, to be present in the biggest tourism, nautical tourism fair in Europe, dedicated to uh, an incredibly important segment of tourism and also transportation. I'm very happy that today I am in the position to share with you our latest global data, talking about the recovery of tourism. So allow me to share our latest barometer data. First of all, uh, we have experienced an incredible rebound that we all probably have seen with our very own eyes, also due to, uh, I would say, a larger season, a larger summer in terms of uh, weather, which allowed many destinations, especially in Europe, to receive many, many tourists from also overseas. Obviously, uh, this has had an impact in the recovery, and we're still talking, if we take 2019 as a point of reference, as a benchmark, we're still talking in negative terms, but that's relative in terms of uh, what was going on in 2019, where I would like to remind everyone, we went to a minus 90% at times, which means basically there was a zero tourism around the world. Now we are in a position globally to say that we are 27% away from full recovery. And if we look at the different regions, obviously Europe is the best performing after the Middle East and together with the Middle East, because um, some of you may recall that we just finished the World Cup in Qatar and the Middle East was a region that, for, for example, in the area of Dubai was able to receive tourists from Russia which in previous years accounted for quite a, an interesting percentage in our uh, Europe to see uh, and had an impact also in the global tourism receipts. When we look at the way that we're performing and we look at our colors, the green is the 2022 and shows that we are absolutely on our way to normality. But in the, in the case of Europe, we have been doing very, very well because some destinations, as you might have heard, have even surpassed the data of 2019. What does it mean? It means that people are going to different destinations. Pandemic has changed a lot in our life. It has changed also not only the way that we book, uh, for example, that we do everything digitally, we look for other elements in the booking, but also the way we think of the tourist destination, uh, the tourism destination that we want to go to. So if we look at these data, this is the clear evidence. Obviously, the US Virgin Islands, the Caribbeans, they've been receiving the majority of the tourists, especially from the US, because you might recall they have done a COVID-free policy basically from the beginning. But in Europe, Emerging destinations like Albania that in the end of 2019 was just becoming the newcomer in the list of destinations in the Mediterranean especially became the best performance plus 17% compared to 2019. So this is incredibly important. Look at Andorra. And if you look in terms of receipts, look at other destinations. Turkey, of course, received also the Russian tourists. So that made an impact in terms of receipts, but also new destinations, Romania, Portugal, Latvia, they were actually doing much better than they did in 2019. Interestingly enough, Italy, for example, or Spain have done slightly uh, less in terms of 2019, even though I will repeat, some destinations have experienced a growth that they weren't even thinking about. 
obviously this we are company with forecasts and we're saying our going back to normality means everything is going to go well and we're going to reach those data again. I always like to say that the questions that we must ask for each and every destination, were these data good? Were those the data that we were running away from in a way because we were saying we're too much or are those really data that were good for the destination? So this is a question that we must ask together with facing a very important challenge that we have in Europe, especially in Europe, because we've all heard of a widespread workforce shortage. But the point is that what are we doing for it? Each and every country is doing policies. Maybe they're thinking of rising the wages or changing the uh, prospects of the tourism uh, jobs. The problem is that at the moment in Europe, we're facing a very strong economic crisis due to the energy crisis. So even raising a wage is becoming an issue. As a result, there's a lot of social instability. So how can tourism help? First of all, we need to always perform very well in the public-private partnership. The public sector and the private sector, especially in tourism, need to work together the best way possible. And the other thing that we need to do, we need to adapt to the demand. The demand has changed. As I was saying, we have changed as consumers, as much as the supply needs to improve to meet this demand. First of all, we need to work, of course, on the type of attractiveness of the tourism sector as a job opportunity, but also in the way that we build our packages, in the way that we shape our destinations to make sure that we are embedding sustainability at its highest level. What do we do? What did we do from the beginning when this crisis hit? First of all, we are stressing and we're never stopping stressing the importance of coordination and collaboration, as I was saying, between public and private, but also among governments above the competition. We need to work together, together also with the European institutions. Of course, we give policy guidance, guidelines, uh, recovery guides, codes like the legal framework to support and to serve as a point of reference. And obviously good data, the ones that I started with. There's no good decision without good data in the background. And this is what we try to do. And bear in mind, we are the official source because we build our database together with the member states. These are data coming from the member states. So we are putting together all the data that we have uh, in our hands directly from the source. And we have much more. We have on our website, unw2.org, a series of uh, instruments that any of you can use to understand not only what is happening in your specific country or in the, let's say, competitor's country or in general in the region, but we also have the dashboards. Dashboards are very useful instruments that will allow you to compare different type of data and to inform your decision better. And of course, whenever we cannot provide you uh, uh, enough, we will always reach out to you and you of course will reach out to us for technical assistance packages. For us, the core pillars of recovery are very simple. Sustainability, sustainability, sustainability. Jobs and skills, and this year is also the uh, European year of skills. Investments and innovation, we are continuing to uh, insist in the rebuilding to be done in a certain way, but also we are uh, continuing to stress the importance of investing and to, of course, together with innovation, to uh, reactivate uh, the economy through tourism. And another core pillar of ours is tourism for rural development. Pandemic has shown us how important it was that we had our inland destinations, that we had our own domestic destinations or the nearby destinations. And those are mostly in what we call the rural uh, parts of the country, which means countries that are maybe areas that are not so developed, but also areas that are developed but are outside the main attraction points. The importance of these destinations is crucial. It was crucial for the reactivation of tourism, and it is crucial for the actual future of tourism. Sustainability. This, we think, is very crucial ahead of uh, our uh, explaining our specific approach for uh, nautical tourism and coastal and maritime tourism as well. 
We have a series of initiatives under the framework of the One Planet vision for responsible recovery of the tourism sector, something that we've done at United Nations level. And this is incredibly important because it positions tourism as one of the key drivers of this sustainable recovery. Among the many instruments, we have two core initiatives and one to be launched. Glasgow Declaration on Climate Action and Tourism, which is an urgent call for commitment to a decade of climate action and tourism. We're committing to cut global tourism emission by at least a half over the next decade and to be net zero by 2050. Signatories are now booming and we are reaching the level of 1000, including private sector and government. And what they do basically, they have to commit to deliver a concrete climate action plan or an updated plan within 12 months of signing. And what they do is you have to, you start from measuring, decarbonizing, regenerating, and then you stress on your collaborative and financial elements to make sure that this works. We also have the Global Tourism Plastics Initiative and the signatories makes a series of actionable commitments with us to be achieved by 2025. Many of these information are available on our website, but of course I and my team are at your disposal to share them as well. Uh, another one, which is on uh, basically on food waste, is about to be uh, absolutely you know streamlined and launched, uh, and it's very very important because food waste, as well as a core element of achieving that circular uh, economy that we all speak about. Of course, all of this is not possible without measuring the sustainability of tourism. We have some key countries, especially in Europe, that are pilots. Uh, for the, the MSTs, as we call them. And the MSTs is basically, we have built the standards for the measurement of sustainability in tourism so that each one of the destinations of the countries, of even of the private sector, can actually say, how do I measure that sustainability? And then we also offer uh, a series of uh, supports and capacity building to build up their statistical framework. Not everybody has it. And we also... Uh, collaborate with them in the quality of data and in the collection of the data. And uh, this is very important, as I said before, having constantly uh, qualitatively high data allows for great decisions. So having said all this, how do we see the challenges and opportunities for the nautical tourism? First of all, nautical tourism is very important for economic development, community development, and job creation. But our key, uh, let's say, uh, challenges at the moment are reputation, pollution, seasonality, and safety and security. We think that the nautical sector and the cruise and uh, uh, maritime sector are the ones that are in the position to invest and really be in the forefront of that sustainability, especially in environmental impact, change that is required in order to achieve these objectives. So what we think are uh, the challenges ahead for uh, this specific and very important uh, type of tourism is to improve the vital tourism infrastructure, to establish crisis management protocols, because of course, what happened with the pandemic created a, a, a disruption that cannot be confronted ever again. So we need to be ready. We have to digitize ecotourism and make sure that the measurement of the impact, especially when it comes to environment, is there. And as well, we need to address circularity. Also, uh, as important as job creation is, and as important as the number of jobs that are generated in the specific nau nautical cruise and maritime sector, it is very important to upskill and reskill tourism professionals. And in order to do that, we also need to make sure that whatever the job is created, it also has a level of consciousness of the impact of tourism in people's lives. This is why it's so important that we stress also on the social aspect of sustainability, which means always include the community, not just talking with the port, not just talking with, let's say, the providers. The community has to be part of it because we also need to surpass what I was mentioning before being that sort of distance that or bad perception or bad press that always maybe not so much the smaller boats but definitely the bigger boats get when it comes to uh you know telling the story and it's very easy to sell that you know it's better to stop
rather than taking up the challenge and having leadership in it. So I would like to thank you very much for the attention. And uh, I remain at your disposal together with my team, with the whole of you and the WTO. And let me wish you a great boat Dusseldorf. Thank you very much.